Okay, so we are recording, and I will be sending out the recording link to the whole registration list um, probably tomorrow. And you're welcome to share that through your social media channels with colleagues, etc. cetera, um, and then watch it on your own time. And we know that a lot of people are watching us as a recording, um, not now, but uh, later on. We have a percentage of you who registered here live and uh, gives you an opportunity to meet with colleagues and interact with the participants, excuse me, with the presenters. But we know a lot of you need to watch this as a recording. So we are going to be taking a look at um, interactive self-paced modules that give students practice with writing in social studies topics. And these lessons were produced by WGBH. <clears throat> WGBH is Boston's PBS station and an educational foundation. We're the oldest and largest public media station in the network. We produce about 40% of all the programs that you watch on your local station. Iconic brands such as Nova, American Experience, Masterpiece, Frontline, etc., they're all produced by WGBH. WGBH has partnered with PBS to produce and offer to teachers and students nationally. a resource site.
PBS Learning Media. And I'd be very curious. Curious if you would let me know in the chat box if PBS. Learning media is already familiar to you. Or if um, It is a new animal. really not sure what it's all about.
media. now and it's One hundred and twenty five thousand
and all. Subjects for K. And it it is all Media, PBS Learning Media, where you will be able to the U.S. history modules that we're going to be showcasing this evening. The featured presenters are India Mysel from Lakeland High School in Virginia and Peter Picconi from San Marino High School in California, and I'm Carolyn Jacobs with WGBH. Both India and Peter are high school teachers, have been high school teachers, uh, social studies teachers for years. India is also the vice president of NCSS, the National Council of Social Studies Teachers, and she will take over and become president-elect this summer. And I feel honored to have you here, India. Um, Peter Picconi has been teaching, uh, I think, 20 years, more than 20 years in California, right now at San Marino High School. He's also a PBS digital innovator for 2016. He's a prolific author and a strong proponent for flipped learning, and um, which is part of, going to be part of his presentation later on. And each of them will tell you a little bit more about their schools and student population when um, it's their turn to take the mic. Um, I know that you have all discovered the chat box on the right-hand side. I hope that's comfortable for you. Uh, we don't. Um, we keep. We ask you to mute your line if you're on your phone using star six so that we don't hear any back.
background noise and so that we avoid Other, just the presenters will be speaking, and but we will be monitoring the chat box. We do get a um, a transcript of the chat, so if we're not able to keep up with questions or comments, um, myself or the presenters, one of the presenters will get back to you individually. So um, on learning media, you will find uh, very short clips, one to three minutes, sometimes longer, uh, support materials. A lot of these clips are coming from full-length programs on public television. Um, interactive activities, lesson plans, audio files, lots of images. And what we're here to talk about tonight, self-paced interactive student lessons. So we're going to be talking about a small group um, that are specifically for social studies. The U.S. History Writing Course, uh, which is on learning media, is a series of six lessons, again, produced by WGBH and funded by the Calderwood Foundation. The lessons are self-paced and interactive, highly engaging, punctuated by reflection and assessment activities. Throughout each lesson, which typically takes one to two class periods, but it depends upon how you use it. And you're going to hear from the teachers about different ways that they use the lesson. So throughout um, each lesson, students are preparing to write an essay in response to a compelling question. They craft their arguments around three supporting questions using built-in on, built online tools for note-taking, close reading, analyzing evidence and outlining and finally writing the essay. The lessons are peppered with primary sources, documents, images, maps, and political cartoons. So the way this all got started is WGBH in collaboration with teachers and our funder, Calderwood, uh, we set out to the idea was to produce lessons that would support student writing. We consulted with John Lee, um, and Kathy Swan, University of uh, Kentucky is Kathy Swan, and John Lee is um, North Carolina State. And they're, they are, uh, I think they were the authors or part of the authoring team of the C3 framework. So we worked with them. They were our initial academic advisors. We used the inquiry framework to develop and organize the lessons. So the pedagogical flow of the lesson is the inquiry arc which is based on the C3 framework. Then further along in our conversation of figuring out what we wanted to do, um, we decided that because this was going to be directed to high school students, we didn't want to use a documentary approach. But instead, we went for illustrated lectures. And you'll see an example of what I mean by that. We worked with historian Ben Weber throughout the lessons. Uh, ben is um, graduated from Brown and Harvard. He's a former high school teacher. In 2001, he was named Teacher of the Year by NCSS, India's organization. And he's currently a visiting scholar at the University of New Orleans. And he is the um, sort of the on-camera host, um, consistent throughout all the lessons. 
And I'm not going to play. Uh, there is a, a very short clip. It's about 15 or 20 seconds that introduces each of the lessons. Um, and But you're going to see Ben in action uh, with the presenter, so I'm going to skip over this. Throughout each lesson, students are preparing to write an essay in response to a compelling question, which I mentioned. They craft their arguments around the supporting questions using the tools. And they are, so they're reading, they're watching, they're writing, and they're thinking. There are six lessons, as I mentioned. These are the topics of three of them, Bill of Rights, Emancipation, Shaping the Post-World War. India is going to be concentrating on the Emancipation Proclamation lesson. Imperialism and Spanish-American War, which is the lesson Peter is going to focus on. And you can see the other two. Um, an example in the, the Bill of Rights um, lesson, the compelling question, the, well, what's going on in the Bill of Rights lesson is the students are exploring why the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution and its enduring impact on defining our rights. They develop, students will develop a written argument in response to the question. So this is the compelling question for this one. How does the Bill of Rights establish and continue to define the rights we have as Americans? I can tell you that um, I was part of lots of meetings and conversations and overhearing them working with um, a pool of academic advisors for each of these lessons whose specialty is the topic. And there was always a lot of debate about what the compelling question should be for each of the lessons. All right. Um, all of the lessons, uh, the six of them that I mentioned, are um, I've put them into a folder. And this is the link for the folder uh, that is on learning media. And you'll get this in the email. I'll also post it in the chat box in a minute. Um, and uh, we're gonna, I'm com going to come back on at the end and talk a little bit more about learning media and some other things that are coming up. So now, um, let's turn the mic over to India. India, you might be muted. You might need to unmute. There we go. Everybody there hear me you now? are. Wonderful. We can hear uh, okay. you loud and clear. Good evening, everyone. My name is India Meisel, as Carolyn said. I'm a 30-year teaching veteran uh, high school. Um, at My current location is Lakeland High School in Suffolk, Virginia, as opposed to the one in Florida, where I serve as department head and have taught every level of US history, uh, from the inclusion to the regular to um, AP level and uh, dual enrollment level, which is what I'm currently teaching now. Um, I use the Emancipation Proclamation with my dual enrollment students uh, this year, and in a moment I'm going to get into that. But just so you know, Lakeland is a school that is um, set in the middle of Suffolk. Suffolk is the home to Planners Peanuts. It is a unique district in that it is both uh, urban, suburban, and rural. And 61% uh, of our students are African American, 34% are white, and 5% are other. And that is because we get a lot of uh, families that move away from both Norfolk Naval Base and uh, the Virginia Beach um, Naval Air Station and want to move out uh, away from the traffic. So it's a, it's a really unique district. Um, my uh, other teaching position at, in the evenings as well as during the day is the dual enrollment instructor over at Paul D. Camp Community College. And the students that I have, um, and I think I was talking to someone in the chat box, um, have the opportunity to get their college uh, associate's degree before they even graduate from high school. So it's a really exciting opportunity for them. One of the requirements the college asks us to do every year is to do, or every semester, is to do an independent learning module. So 
when uh, a couple of years ago when I was actually helping advise for a couple of these modules, I started thinking, you know, this would be great to use with these kids as their independent learning module. And the, the modules are actually set up in a variety of means that you can use them in the classroom or you can use them in a flipped classroom setting. Now, Peter's going to get into uh, a, a, an interesting way of doing his as a flipped classroom, but with the Emancipation Proclamation being kind of more specific than the broader aspect of the Spanish-American War, um, I allowed my students to do this as luck would have it as a snow activity because we had about 12 inches of snow a couple of weeks ago and it, it shut us down for several days. So um, they did the predominance of the, the module at home and quite frankly we came back in and we spent a day discussing various aspects of it um, uh, in class. So let's go ahead and, and get, get along here. As Carolyn said, um, the module is set up with video clips, readings, and primary sources, which has the students analyze those materials. I, I guess I still have some of the AP teacher in myself in that I require my students in my dual enrollment classes to still use the old AP um, tools of the SOAPs and the AP parts method to break down these primary forces. In 1898, the United uh, States dispatched this boat, the USS Maine, learning, to the Havana Harbor, in, and they just put it there as a symbol of strength so and theoretically to protect American attack. interests in Cuba. Um, the boat explodes under weird, uh, mysterious circumstances. Uh, the, the, this telegram the, came the, uh, right when it first exploded. Is the overarching this was question of what, what way did the front page across the United States immediately. The term yellow journalism what I like about this when I first looked at it was the fact that the question is up front. That is your writing prompt. And to me, it helps focus yellow my journalism. students on where are they going. Yeah. Where are they going as they go through this module? And um, when... Let's see. Okay, here we go. Um, the complex story starts, and, and it's a good take on what we call the KWL chart. And I don't have my students do a K KWL, but it does ask the anticipatory set in its own right. Um, it tells you about, of course, the traditional narrative, and then the video clip that comes along um, introduces and dispels the myth of the Emancipation Proclamation. Oops, wait a minute, wrong one. Okay, so we'll take a moment here and here we go. Okay, you can see from the clip that um, it, it returns the students back to the, the original question, which ways does the Emancipation Proclamation expand the ideas of freedom and liberty in America? It also makes them think, okay, what viewpoint might you be taking? Are you going to take the viewpoint that Abraham Lincoln himself freed the slaves, and it was all his idea, or are you going to take the other approach that Ben was talking about, at that the enslaved and free people of color influenced his decision to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, as you keep on going through the module, you will come to, oops, sorry, 
going a little bit faster here. Um, this portion uh, that starts talking about the anti-slavery debate. And again, there's two primary sources on the screen. So for a lot of school divisions and, and states, states such as mine, where they have a very heavy emphasis on primary sources of all types, you know, speech clips, everything, this clicks off some of those boxes. It gives you the opportunity to look at documents that maybe you don't necessarily see. They aren't always necessarily in the common realm. And you have um, uh, speech excerpts as well. Within this particular portion of the lesson, the anti-slavery meetings, there is a clip. I'm not going to show that one tonight because we just simply don't have enough time for everything. But the clip does point out the four anti-slavery approaches. And if I had put the rest of the box on here, which would have made the writing very small, the rest of the chart is a fill in on what would or would not advance the idea of freedom in America as far as each approach is concerned. So students are watching the clip. They're analyzing. They're thinking. They're filling in the charts. They're being prepared for what is going to come down the line. The part I think my students enjoyed the most was this portion called a complicated legacy. And this kind of shaped the discussion that we had in class as to um, what I call thought objects. Looking at memorials, how do we memorialize people, events, how do we remember folks in our history? How do we recognize our own family or someone in our own history? So it led to a really interesting discussion amongst my students in that as they were studying the statue, and I put the statue back up when we came into class, um, I asked them, I said, you know, do you approve of this statue? You know, set the context of when this statue was designed. And fortunately, I have several art students in one of my classes. And I said, you know, let's analyze this. Is this a statue that you would be proud of today? Is this a statue that uh, you would think would be fitting today? And a couple of my students gave me permission to use their quotes in, in this discussion. And they said, you know, while Lincoln is seen, of course, as the hero to the slaves, the monument also makes the freed slaves look very submissive. They didn't like the fact that, that the slave was on the knees at Lincoln's feet. One young lady goes on to say, and that's the bottom quote, the monument uses the stereotypical black person in the rags, very meek, savagely crouching, and gives all credit to Lincoln. She goes on, and, and this is the young lady that I'm really highly impressed with, um, where is the monument to the freedmen, or where in the monument, to the freedmen, the abolitionists who were on the front lines for many years? It pretty much gives away credit to anyone but Lincoln. So we continued on with our discussion on um, why is it important to keep history, you know, people, places, and events in our memory and memorialize them. And should we remember or memorialize events? And that led to an interesting discussion, because some students were saying that some things we need to just move on. And others were saying, well, you know, no, we need to continue you know, the, the legacy so we can learn from our history. Then the final question that we were discussing in class, and this went almost half a block, was what should we do years later when our views or our knowledge of certain events change? Should we go back and redesign a memorial? Um, should we leave it as it is and decide something new and place it next to it? How should we go about updating our history? Because it's not as easy as updating, say, a textbook or an online module.
So after the students go through the module, and, and there's approximately 12 slides. I mean, they're not huge. They're not long. Um, some of my students said, you know, this was the perfect length, perfect amount of reading. It gave you things to look at, you things to study, and then you come to the end. And on the, the next to the last slide and the very last slide, this is the screen 12 is actually the last slide of this module. The slide before it, slide 11, has on there small boxes where a student, if they want to, can go back and look at any video. They can go back and look at the readings. They can go back and look at all the aspects of the module without having to click back and back and back. And then it goes down to the bottom where it says, now use Write It to expand your outline. And in that box, it will offer tips and suggestions for how you should, you know, things you should think about in your writing. It, should, it asks questions or makes points that maybe you should include in your writing. And then it you know, gives you the suggestions to, to get you started. It goes back once again to the original question of the entire module and then sets, you know, sets the students to go ahead and start writing. Now, at this point in time, I can't remember if, if Carolyn mentioned this or not, um, it is not set up to where you can save your work on the system. I think that's going to come um, a little bit later this spring. So what I ended up doing was taking the essential uh, questions and such and making a handout. That way my students could write it all on this handout and refer back to it when they were, uh, of course, doing their five-paragraph essay. You can do all sorts of things. That's, that's the beauty of this module. Um, I happen to use it again as a flipped lesson because we had snow and I lost several days. But you can use it as an in-class assignment. Um, I have a, a daughter that is special needs. And I've also worked with special needs students in an inclusion setting for almost 20 years. Um, I had one of my special needs students come in and take a look at the module. And they said, yes, Ms. Meisel, we certainly could use this. I mean, I, I could do this lesson. And I wasn't picking you know, the, the top of the uh, special needs as far as um, you know, students are concerned. I just picked an ordinary kid. And they said a few things. You might have to uh, modify depending on someone's need, but otherwise, this is something that, that definitely I think any special ed student could use and, and do well at. Um, I also took a look as I sat down with this and I asked my students, what would, you, what would you want to do if we had more time, if we hadn't lost time with the snow? And my kids said they would love to take that portion of the anti-slavery approaches, do some more research, maybe debate the positions, and then let their classmates decide who won the debate and, in essence, which anti-slavery approach they felt, based on the discussion, should be used. So it, it opens itself up not only as a writing assignment, but it opens itself up to additional activities that you can certainly do in your classroom. My young lady who uh, made the comment about the, the uh, monument looking, the, the slaves with the freedman looking like he was in uh, a savage crouch said, Ms. Marcel, I'd love to have the opportunity to go into the art room and design a new memorial. I'd love to work in a group, design something out, and actually put it together, whether it was in clay, whether it was um, drawn, however you wanted to go about it. So that was a new avenue. And that gave that student you know, an idea that they might have a creative nature to it. And then as Ben and I, uh, not Ben, but as Peter and I were talking recently, he said, you know, do you have problems with kids that um, eventually get the younger brothers and sisters? And I said, well, yeah, I do. And he said, well, how do you combat it? And I said, well, I tend to try to get essays and writing prompts and stuff like that and rotate them about every four or five years. So even if 
uh, Carolyn and PBS uh, choose not to go that approach, my thought was, well, I'll present uh, four or five different writing prompts and be able to rotate them so it continues to be a very fresh module for my students and not one that a kid's going to take their notes and wait or print out their notes once the platform gets set and hand to their younger siblings. Because I want this to be an authentic learning experience, not something that kids go, oh, Ms. Meisel's going to do such and such. So therefore, here, you can have my notes. So you know, the, the one thing I would say is don't be scared with this. It, it's a wonderful activity. Um, again, with the Emancipation Proclamation being a little bit more narrow than what Peter's going to present, it made the perfect flipped classroom lesson that I could put in the midst of my unit on the Civil War and still take the opportunity to spend some time in discussion with the students. We probably would have done more had we, again, not lost time for snow. So at that point, this point, I'm going to hand things off to my colleague Peter and let him take you through the Spanish-American War and how he uses that in his classroom. Uh, great. Thank you. India, excuse me, one second, Peter. Uh, great. Uh, India, I'm sorry for interrupting. Just um, there are lots of activity in the chat box, so while Peter is speaking, you might be able to um, help some people out in the chat box. All right. So uh, thank you, India, and thank you, Carolyn, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as you can see from the slide here, I teach at San Marino High School. Uh, San Marino High School is located about 20-some-odd uh, miles uh, northeast of downtown Los Angeles. It's a beautiful little community uh, near the Pasadena Rose Bowl and, and something called the Huntington Gardens. Uh, San Marino is a, uh, a high-achieving school. Uh, we like to think of it as one of the better, if not one of the best, comprehensive uh, high schools in the state of California, K through 12, certainly by way of, of the test scores of the past. Uh, we, we rank that way, and certainly of the ones just this past year. Um, uh, I have taught here for 30 some odd years. Uh, I, have, I have taught the AP classes. I've taught the regular classes. Uh, currently, I teach a regular U, uh, US government. I teach world history. And in the summers, I teach the US history class. Um, as far as this particular lesson is concerned, before I, I describe it, I would just like to, to say that um, Despite the fact that I've mentioned that this is such a high achieving school, and I'm sure there are certain assumptions there about the kids I have and, and how hard they work and how well they do and so on, um, I do believe that this particular lesson, as I'm going to describe it, works really well uh, for world history students, not just US history students. I believe it would work extremely well for those of you who are middle school teachers. Uh, I've seen a, a number, or some of you say that you're special education teachers. Uh, it has worked really well with my U.S. history special ed students, um, the person who talked about having just smartphones, what I'm about to describe, I think works really well with if that's all you have. Um, and for the first year teacher, again, um, I, regardless of the number of years of experience that you've had, I think what I'm going to describe works for everybody. Um, so let me I'll get right into it here. Uh, I flip this lesson. And for those of you who uh, are familiar with flipping, if you uh, forgive me, I'm just going to take a quick second to kind of explain it. For those of you uh, who aren't flipping takes the traditional concept of teaching, where a teacher explains the content and then sends the kids home to do the homework, and it flips that notion. So instead of the teacher delivering the content in the classroom, the students are going home and for homework. Uh, they are learning the content. And, and typically, most people think that means, and it does mean, that they are going to watch some teacher-produced video. So maybe my lecture the students will watch. And it can certainly be done that way. But the definition of flipping also encompasses um, watching a, a TED-Ed lesson and learning the content there, or watching one of these lessons, these interactive lessons that have been produced, and learning the content there. And then, coming into class, being held accountable for what they learned at home, briefly held accountable, and 
Then the question becomes, well, then what is class time used for? If the teacher isn't going to be the content deliverer, what is class time used for? And essentially what the answer is, to engage students in meaningful um, and informative and engaging classroom activity. That's what I do with this particular lesson. I have them uh, take home. Uh, before anything else, what I do is I tell them before, I, before I've taught anything about the Spanish-American War at all, even introduced the term imperialism. I'm finishing off my unit on uh, this one uh, preceded by, by the students learning about imperialism in China. And what I'll tell the students is, OK, you're now going to go home. And for homework, uh, you're going to read and take notes on the Spanish-American War website, this website that, that we're looking at here. And I tell them they can take one page of notes. Um, I'm going to give them a few days in which to do that. And they, then what they're also going to do is write an essay that answers the question prompt that is revealed in this lesson. And the question is, was the United States justified in going to war with Spain in 1898? So the students go home. I finish off my unit uh, of learning on Chinese imperialism, and or the imperialization of China, I should say. And, uh, while I'm finishing that off, the students are looking at this lesson. They are watching the videos. They are taking their one page of notes on what's revealed in the videos, and also what is revealed in the reading in the readings that accompany the video. And then they come to class. And on the day when those notes are due, I give them an open note quiz. I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. And then I spend the rest of that day, and oftentimes the next day, in an activity, which I'll also explain here in just a moment. When the activity is done, I then give the students a chance to answer or to write the essay in class. Uh, most times, at least as I've experimented with this, I have not allowed them to use, uh, to bring in the work. What I have them do is write the essay at home and then work from memory to try and recall that in class. For a certain number of students, I, I may make some modifications. And I have them hand in what they wrote at home, plus then also what they write in class. I believe that's a way to reinforce some learning there. And we can talk about that later. But that's how I do it. And it's worked fairly effectively. And um, my opinion uh, has really caused them to learn the content that's delivered by this lesson. So let me just, uh, for a moment here, show you a clip of this video. Now, let me just see here. I am going to Carolyn, are you clicking this, or am I clicking this? No, you are. Mm -hmm. Got it. OK. This is So bring this on back. So what we had here was a clip uh, from the lesson, a, a clip that the students find particularly interesting. This whole very intriguing story of the thinking of the Maine and the extent to which, uh, what was the cause of this? Still some mystery about that today, although maybe in the last year or two that mystery has finally been resolved, depending on how you want to read the evidence. But in any event, so they're watching the video. They're taking notes on the video. Now they're going to come into class with their one page of notes, and I'm going to give them this open note quiz. Uh, ten, top ten questions, basically 15 answers possible. Every teacher can, of course, work that their own way. But I just need to take a look at some of these questions. 1898, the United States were paying close attention to the events in Cuba, where Cuban guerrillas were fighting for independence from Spain. I have listed for you here the questions. You can take a look at those. These are drawn directly from content that is delivered in the videos and in the accompanying readings. Um, you can see here the answer is Philippines, anti-imperialist, imperialist, yellow journalism, the Pulitzer, uh, and Hearst newspaper, the, effect, the effects that they've had, and of course the sinking of the Maine. And then this question of what happened as a result of the Spanish-American War, our acquisition of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the 
Philippines, uh, ending with a question on the correct answer is imperialism. I also uh, give them, oh, excuse me, I also give them a, a map and uh, ask them to simply locate for me the Puerto Rico, Philippines, and Guam, and then, of course, Cuba as well. So then what I do is I have, uh, for the activity, uh, I have the student, I tell the students that what we're going to do is engage in a Socratic-like seminar. And for those of you who've never done that, uh, there are a number of different ways to do it. Uh, the way I structure this particular one, I form I, form, I divide the class into half and I form two circles. There's an inner circle and an outer circle. The inner circle takes on the role of Puerto Ricans today. The outer circle takes on the members of Congress today. If you want a rough idea of what that might look like, typical kind of classroom, inner circle, outer circle, inner circle is Puerto Rico. Fill that with the students, it might look something like this. Then what I tell them is we are going, the students, both circles, are going to address the question that uh, flows from this lesson on the Spanish-American War. As a result of the Spanish-American War, the United States, of course, acquired Puerto Rico. So the question today is what should Congress do about Puerto Rico? And the students are given four choices. Continue to grant Puerto Rico commonwealth status. In other words, do nothing, leave it, leave it as it is today. Grant Puerto Rico enhanced commonwealth status, which would allow Puerto Ricans to vote in the presidential election and probably secure for Puerto Ricans a little bit more money from the United States on an annual basis. Number three, grant Puerto Rico statehood, making it the 51st state, and grant Puerto Rico independence. What I then allow is, uh, uh, if they are interested, uh, there is a, a reading that they can look at, um, not 